Hello everybody, I'm Mayor John Landwehr. Welcome to another edition of Capital City Matters. It's a time when we take about a half an hour and we talk about uh, some issues and things that are going on in the community and we get to spend a little more time on them than, than maybe you'd see in a normal news broadcast or even at a city council meeting or some other type of forum. Uh, today, I've got um, a couple of uh, friends uh, to help me with a, with a very interesting and timely issue. We have Lauren Hershey. Lauren is an administrative technician uh, at the city in the, uh, in the environmental quality uh, division of the community services department. That's a long title, Lauren, <laughs> welcome. Thank you. And also have uh, Jim Crabtree, a good friend. Jim served on the Environmental Quality Commission for about 12 years. And so between the two of them, they probably know as much about uh, trash and recycling uh, as it pertains to our community as any other two people. So welcome, thanks for coming by. Thanks for having us. Thank you, John. You know, sometimes we, we, get, <clears throat> we, get, um, uh, the, we get kind of fixated on, on the topic of the day, and we're, we're, we're gonna talk about our, our solid waste contract in a little bit, our trash contract, and uh, try to get some information out and get some history on that, on that issue, but really, uh, I've concluded that that, that solid waste agreement um, uh, is really part of a big picture. And that, that, that picture, especially in the past year or so, I think, uh, as far as I can tell, has really started to um, have, a other, have another several components. So what I'm beginning to see really is a community as a whole that's starting to get its act together with regard to a lot of recycling and solid waste issues. Lauren, um, I'm going to take a couple of these in, in maybe reverse order, but <clears throat> one, one of the last projects that, that you have been working on and that, that is now implemented is glass. Um, it's my understanding that glass doesn't work well with other waste streams because it breaks <clears throat> and it tends to, it tends to pollute the, the, rest of the rest of the trash, makes it harder to handle and harder to sort and deal with. So glass has always been, it seems like kind of the stepchild. Mm -hmm. of any recycling program. <clears throat> but uh, we've come up with kind of a solution. Tell me about it. We have. We are working with Ripple Glass out of Kansas City. And what we've done is we've set up two drop-off locations in the city. One is located at 722 Dix Road, where the old Allied Waste offices used to be. And the other one is on the Save-A-Lot parking lot. And residents and citizens and anybody who really wants to use them can take their food and beverage container glass there, um, dump it in the containers, and then take their bags and boxes home with them because we only really want the glass in there. And then when they're full, we take them to one location, and then Ripple Glass will come get them when we have about 25 tons of glass. Our first load was 21 tons, so that's pretty good, I'd say, so far. So that's 21 tons of stuff that would certainly have have gone into the landfill because it's not going to go anywhere else. We, we, it doesn't fit into any of the other recycling schemes, right? Right. It could have gone to the landfill. It could have gone as waste on the side of the road. So, and, and all, we're helping to clean up the community, too, by providing outlets for glass. Now, we got those two containers, I think, because of a grant. We participate in the, is it the Missouri Solid Waste District? What's the official name of that? The Mid-Missouri Solid Waste Mid -Missouri. Management <clears throat> District. Those first two containers, actually one we already owned and one was donated, and then we're getting ready to expand the glass through a grant. So we'll get two more containers. So we'll have a total of four drop-off locations throughout the city. Um, now, it's important, I think, to remind the viewers that, that there are certain types of glass that we really shouldn't be putting in those bins. Is that right? Right. No windows, no Pyrex or ceramics or windshields, nothing like that. Okay. Well, another thing and, uh, that, that has come up recently has been uh, e-waste. Um, mm -hmm. I, I might ask Jim this. Um, um, we, we're a computer generation, and we get used to all kinds of PCs and hard drives and, and monitors, and we take them for granted. But one thing I've noticed is that they make me buy one about every year. Right? <laughs> so the old ones have become a problem. Yeah, Tell me about that. Planned obsolescence, John. Uh, but uh, the good news is many components uh, of uh, computers uh, and uh, monitors can be recycled and reused. So uh, what you're finding is uh, there are companies and industries uh, that uh, seek to uh, recycle those, uh, to collect them uh, and reuse what they can, um, 
you know, the plastic uh, shrouds uh, are recyclable. The, and then, like I said, many of the components. Uh, and maximize the return, if you will, uh, on that product. And Lauren, we, the city has, uh, your department has created some opportunities for folks to bring that stuff to a location. Can you tell me about that? We do. We have two e-waste collections set up in conjunction with the spring cleanup days. They're both going to be on Saturday, April 23rd and Saturday, April 30th from 9 to 1 in the City Hall parking lot. Great. So uh, monitors are the, big, are the big components, but also clunky hard drives, uh, uh, cell phones, uh, mm -hmm. any, anything that's electronic. A lot of that stuff really shouldn't be going into the landfill, right? Right. Anything you can plug in. Anything you can plug in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we also, um, I, I know when, whenever I move, I always find about, about a ton of stuff that I really should have thrown away, never have. It's sitting on a shelf, and a lot of it's kind of um, dangerous stuff. It's paint, mm -hmm. uh, stuff like that. We have a mm -hmm. program house for household hazardous waste. Tell me about that. Yes. Um, we call it HHW for short. Um, it's a joint city county allied waste project. We've come together and that, this is funded through a grant through the Mid-Missouri Solid Waste Management District and it's going to be located <coughs> at, out at Hyde Park and every second and fourth Wednesday of each month from March until October will be open from 9 to 1 by appointment only and people can bring their household hazardous waste and you can find a complete list of items that are accepted and not accepted on the city's website and it's open to city and county residents. We might remind the viewers that a lot of this information that, that we're putting out in terms of dates and things of that nature, they can just go to www.jeffcitymode.org and it's, and it's all there. Um, pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, there's a lot of weird stuff in, in uh, medicine cabinets. Uh, you know, the older we get, the more pills we take and <laughs> sometimes we don't sometimes we don't take them all or we get sick for a little bit and then we don't take them anymore and there's a lot of stuff lurking in those um, those medicine cabinets and uh, it's really not not a good idea to put those in the waste in the normal waste stream right right um, pharmaceuticals along with household hazardous waste have a tendency to leak into the groundwater and we want to try to avoid that as much as pot as possible to preserve water quality and um, the police department has been extremely helpful in spearheading the pharmaceutical pickup days. Um, they have to be done by a county sheriff or a police department member, so they've been ex very helpful in, in be doing these for the community. Okay, so we have, we have a couple of those coming up, and once again, all the schedules we can get on the uh, city website. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we've been talking about, about uh, trying to not uh, let um, electronic components into the landfill and we've uh, our medications into the landfill where we've uh, hazardous waste are our problem going into the landfill um, glass uh, we finally it looks like we figured out a way to divert uh, uh, trash from uh, the landfill and to be and to be recycled those are all components of a, of a kind of a broader picture and I want to talk a little bit about, um, about our current um, solid waste agreement. Um, and uh, it's got a little bit of, well, it's got a, not a little bit, it's got a lot of history uh, to it. And um, Jim Crabtree was the chairman of the Environmental Quality Commission, really. Uh, dur during those years when, when, we, when we tried various ways to uh, get a recycling system going uh, into the city, uh, we have one now. We have about 15 months of, of a track record uh, on it, and I wanted to visit with uh, Jim, and Lauren's got some information too. But uh, Jim, this, this didn't happen overnight. This was a long time coming. It, re it really was, John. Um, it was probably, in all, a five-year process. Uh, we started hearing uh, concerns from citizens about uh, having to stack the recyclables in their garage and uh, sort them in different bins or boxes and then drive them to a collection point. Uh, we had a lot of concern that the collection uh, points weren't being emptied enough and people would drive there with a carload of uh, recyclables and then have to drive them back home. And uh, so we started looking at what options are. We looked at other communities uh, and we saw a definite trend uh, with waste haulers uh, throughout the state. 
The first is that bags were, uh, were not being renewed. Uh, and when contracts with waste haulers uh, were made, uh, they were not permitting the bags. And those, that, would, those would be the bags that we, we kind of became used trash to. Trash collection, yeah, we trash had clear plastic. Bags, uh -huh. Clear plastic bags. And yeah, and the problem that the, the haulers uh, raised is uh, back injuries uh, from having to manually pick them up and throw them into the truck. The other trend uh, that we saw is uh, communities were doing citywide collection and uh, they were uh, doing curbside recycling. Uh, we were surprised at how much of a minority the city of Jefferson was in uh, with the, I guess, uh, subscription type uh, service that we had uh, and the taking your recycling to a collection point. Somebody, somebody, somebody gave me a statistic that, that's, that's kind of astounding. Out of, I think, 21 cities our size yes. mm -hmm. in, in, in Missouri, excluding the, you know, St. Louis and Kansas City, but out of 21 cities our size, 19 of them have a, have a citywide service. Yes, yeah. And, and I think that's going to uh, move to a higher percentage, uh, to 100% uh, in probably the next five years. Uh, the other thing that, that we found in talking to Allied Waste is we were surprised at the uh, short life left on our landfill. At the time we started this, uh, you know, they were saying 14 to 15 years. And the, the procedures that you have to go through, as we all became familiar with when Fulton was struggling with trying to permit a new, uh, a new landfill, uh, are just tremendous. And the costs are tremendous. So, uh, you know, we started exploring avenues that would reduce the uh, waste line going into the landfill and meet the public's needs. Through the course of time, John, we did actually uh, three independent surveys to see what people would like. We also did a pilot program with uh, just under 300 residents uh, to see if this curbside recycling uh, and collection would be effective. And when we come back, we're going to go back in the history a little bit more. We're going to talk about um, how it's working. We have 15 months of a track record. So mm -hmm. after a short break, we'll come back and we'll follow up on uh, on that topic that everybody enjoys these days, we're going to talk trash. <laughs> Say Merry Christmas. <laughs> Did you have a good Christmas? Yeah. Get lots of stuff. Yay! <laughs> Get your horsey. Do something cute. You're just going to sit there and grin. If you don't stop your friend from driving drunk, who will? Do whatever it takes. Terrell Bishop is angry and taking to the street again tonight to take it back from pushers and gangs and make it safe for his four-year-old. Whose side are you on? Terrell is a mad dad, family men who work with local authorities to keep their neighborhoods safe. Not everyone has to take to the streets, but everyone can take a step to help kids. Call us, we're fighting for the children. Whose side are you on? Welcome back to Capital City Matters. I'm Mayor John Landwehr, and uh, we were having a, 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 an exciting discussion with Lauren Hershey from the city of Jefferson and uh, Jim Crabtree, who is a veteran at the Environmental Quality uh, Commission. And uh, we were talking about uh, interesting things uh, all related to trash. And we started out the program by talking about all the things that we're pulling out of that landfill stream, electronics, glass, household waste, uh, pharmaceuticals, and now now we're centering on kind of what happens to everything else. Um, and Jim was giving us a, kind of a history during his reign on the not reign during his participation uh, on, on the Envir Environmental Quality Commission. About f as, as many as five years ago, the commission started started thinking about this contract that was coming up for renewal. Now I'll go back a little bit farther. 
Does anybody remember the blue bins? Mm -hmm. Do you remember the blue bins? It was I do. A, it was an experiment in, in uh, curbside recycling, mm -hmm. and it was voluntary. And and if you wanted to if you wanted to recycle, uh, I think the cost was two dollars a month, mm -hmm. and you got a blue bin. Yep. And we did it. Well, we we, we well I, I did it. Mm -hmm. You did it, mm -hmm. but. I don't think many other people nope. did it. Well, and the other problem, John, I remember distinctly, it's an open bin, and you'd put your papers in one, your cans in the other, and on windy days like we've been having in the Ides of March, you'd be chasing around the neighborhood picking up your <laughs> recyclables. So fast forward three or four years ago, we knew that, that the uh, current uh, uh, trash contract was coming up for renewal. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned before the break, we knew that our landfill was uh, had a finite life, and that life was getting shorter and shorter. And you were talking, uh, you made a great point about, we've, we've come to take that landfill for granted, mm -hmm. and we have very low tipping fees. It affects residential rates and commercial rates a lot also. And we've become, I think, uh, I think a little complacent with, the, with that landfill. And Jim, um, landfills are expensive when you need one, mm -hmm. they right? Are. They are very, and this is privately owned, so right. th this isn't a given. Yeah. So we have a landfill with a finite life, and every year that we can extend that life is, is another year that we can keep those rates lower. Mm -hmm. So um, what did the city do back about three years ago? You mentioned a pilot project? Maybe? Yes, <clears throat> we had a little less than 300 uh, residences. We tried to broaden the mix uh, in terms of uh, user types, and uh, we had a three-month pilot where we actually brought in uh, the bins. We worked with Allied and, uh, so that they would pick up uh, a trash collection and a recyclable. Uh, it was two times a week, uh, similar to what we have now, but it was once for trash and once for recyclables. And the people within that study area at first were not very happy. Uh, there was a lot of concern and we uh, had a lot of informative meetings to explain the process and you know, just ask them to bear with us so we could test it. At the end of that program, people were literally calling up and demanding we leave both bins. Uh, you know, there was just a huge shift. And uh, the participation rates were in the 90 percentiles. And we found that those were skewed because the few people who didn't participate were in Florida. <laughs> so um, you know, we, we really thought it was a big success. Uh, and the feedback we got indicated a big success. So we're thinking, you know, this report comes uh, to the city council and city staff, and we're, we're thinking that, you know, there's fairly good acceptance of a recycling program. Um, uh, we concluded pretty, pretty early on, going back to the blue bin experiment, we concluded pretty early on that a recycling program uh, isn't going to work unless it's citywide. Right. Um, I, the, the volumes aren't there. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't have everybody participating in the project, uh, you, you don't have the volumes to justify the expenditure of the equipment and the additional routes. Mm -hmm. um, so we, uh, we put it to bid. We had a, we had a bid process, right? And uh, um, allied bid. And uh, we went through, gosh, uh, probably nine, ten months mm -hmm. of, of discussion and, and negotiation. That's correct. Um, the end results were some, uh, uh, was a citywide service. Correct. Jim, how do the rates compare, um, how, how, how do our rates compare both with um, other communities, uh, but also with um, areas of the county outside the city that, mm -hmm. that, that don't have a contract that was put out to bid? How do our rates look? John, that's a very good question. And what surprises me is how good our rates are. Uh, we are under the benchmarks uh, from our neighboring communities. Uh, just looking at Cole County, uh, we're 10 to $12 less per month uh, for trash service that in the county they have once a week trash service and no recycling. And uh, so we're, we're paying less and we're getting much, much more. Uh, and we have the fringe benefits of uh, is taking, uh, uh, taking trash out of the stream for the landfill through recycling. Now, Lauren, your department has your office has been trying to trying to get a handle on some numbers, and we've got now about a 15-month run under the new contract. Uh, um, is it making a difference? Do you think? Yes, since they've started the single stream and citywide recycling program in trash in general, they've we've been able to recover over a thousand tons of waste that was either being illegally dumped 
on the side of the road or in commercial dumpsters, in parks, or being illegally burned. So we've actually helped to create a cleaner Jefferson City because of this contract. You know, I was on the city council for seven years, and then I was mayor eight years. And, and I'll tell you one of the most persistent calls I got. It, it, it wasn't the neighbor's grass. It wasn't the neighbor's dog. There was a lot of frustration out there in the commercial community. Uh, the car dealers and the apartment owners, uh, every, every Monday morning, uh, their, their dumpsters were full. Yeah. And John, I, uh, you know, at Central Bank, uh, we would have our dumpsters emptied on Friday afternoon, and Monday morning they were full. So there's, <laughs> there, there's a, a big chunk. So we're so so there's we're we're finding we're finding mm -hmm. more trash that was, we we don't know exactly where it was going, but it was probably wasn't going anywhere good. Right. We're finding more trash, but I f I find the level of recycling, the volume of recycling. Uh, really startling. How, how are the recycling levels happening? The recycling levels have increased too. We recycle on average over 200 tons from residential homes a month. And John, th that's, a, that's a significant number because we, I went back and I looked at the numbers that we were uh, re uh, receiving from New World uh, as, you know, for people taking the recycling there. This has increased sevenfold. Not twice, not two times, not three times, but sevenfold. So as a community, we're, we're, by a factor of seven, we're, we're pulling more trash out of that, more recycling out, out of that normal trash stream. That's correct. And other communities who've moved this way have found that, uh, that same trend, although not to this degree. I think it's tremendous uh, that we have taken so much uh, trash and we're being able to recycle it. You know, I, I had a, I, I was at our Kiwanis meeting a couple of weeks ago, and we had, we had a presentation for, from a from a very fine community group, Habitat for Humanity, mm -hmm. and uh, it was it was a presentation about the many fine things they're doing. And there was a question from the audience, and I didn't know the answer to the question. And so when when it was asked, I thought, Wow, I don't, I wonder, I wonder what the answer is going to be. And the question was, because what, because the speaker talked about their sources of income, and one of their sources of income are these are these uh, can shacks that they have around town where you can take your cans. And that's a pretty significant source of income for them. And there was, there was a lot of concern going into our program when we went citywide with our single stream recycling program. There was a concern at, 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 the, at the Habitat for Humanity office that that, 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 would, that, that would take away from their, uh, from their uh, can income. And the answer startled me, it's increased. It has, and and when I, Jim, what, what's the explanation? You, mm -hmm. you 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 would you would intuitively think that 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 if 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 somebody had a place to put their can that was really easy in our single stream recycling system, that they wouldn't take it to Habitat. What's going? On? Well, I think the phenomenon is is a little different than that. The uh, recycling has never been so easy. Uh, I mean, you're right. You open a lid and you put in everything uh, that is uh, permitted. Uh, I think pe more people are um, participating in recycling program because of that reason, because it's been so easy. And I think more people are also thinking, well, you know, if instead of putting the can in this bin, I can put it in this box, and I'm only driving one small box uh, to a collection center. Uh, so it's an attitudinal shift uh, that I think you've seen within the population. And if you remember, uh, Habitat did come to one of our forums and raise that very concern. Uh, and I really wasn't sure how that would go either. Um, but I too have found that it's uh, increased uh, somewhat significantly for them. Lauren, do you see in the future, do you, what, is, this, is this trend gonna con continue? Uh, we're, we're pulling a lot of stuff out of, out of, the, out of the system. What's, what's on the horizon? Anything else coming along? Or are we, are we gonna just try to keep doing what we're doing but do it better? <laughs> Well, re recycling is something you have to keep in front of people or else, they or else they forget about it. If you don't remind people to recycle, they're not going to. Um, so, and along with the habitat thing, people are, people are finally paying attention to where their items are going and, and what can be reused into what. And we look forward to providing as many recycling opportunities to the residents as we possibly can. We've got alley cat trailers portable recycling trailers for large events that are going to be coming also. I mean, we're, we're excited to take 
recycling to places Jefferson City has never seen. So. And John, one thing I'd add on that is uh, your uh, in destinations for recyclables, uh, the corporations uh, are looking for more opportunities because it, it costs 75% less to make cans from recycled cans. Uh, it costs 40% uh, less to make glass bottles from recycled glass bottles. So uh, it's an economic benefit. Uh, and we're all trying to tighten the belt. So I think that those corporations that are implementing these programs uh, are also putting pressure uh, that we need this. You know, I, I know there are a lot of folks out there that, and I, I, I kind of like my bags because I would, um, you know, I used to kid my wife that we have the greatest compact, trash compactor in the world, and that's, that's my, my shoes. And it was unbelievable how much stuff I could get in those bags. But Jim, you made the point earlier, and I think it's good for the listeners to know that the bags, the bags are the eight-track tapes of the trash world. That's right. Um, they are, uh, it, if you have bags, you always have a two-man truck. Mm -hmm. It increases your labor, and then the workers' comp injuries from. And so the, the mechanized system is, is here to stay. It keeps those costs down, and I think we, um, I, I, think, I think folks are getting used to it. I, I think at first it was, it was kind of strange, you know, different days of the week and two bins, and I, th I, I have people come up to me, and, and, and uh, they're, uh, they're really getting used to it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we've covered a lot of ground today. Uh, Lauren, Jim, thanks for coming. Uh, it's, it's a great topic. It's a topic that I hope the community uh, keeps after uh, in, in, the, in the next administration, and I'm sure they will. You guys have really been pioneers in, in helping us along, and I appreciate your efforts, and I appreciate you coming today. Well, thank you, thank John. You. Uh, to the viewers at home, thanks for tuning in uh, for another edition of Capital City Matters. We'll uh, hit you next month with, a, with another intriguing, intriguing topic where we spend a little time on it and we pick it apart. Hope you're having a great day. Yeah.